welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm Andrea. And I'm Madeline. And this is episode 115. Fruity Knitting is a 90 minute program bringing you knitting inspiration from around the world as well as extra snippets of travel, history and storytelling to add joy to your life and bring a smile to your face. Yes, we hope it does. So we're really happy to be back with you again after our long trip traveling around the UK, gathering lots of new content and interviews to share with you. While we were away, we put out a couple of travel vlogs showing you some of the places that we visited and some behind the scenes footage of a few of the interviews that we did. And the feedback that we received was that the vlogs were a lot of fun and people really enjoyed watching them. So if you'd like to see them, you can find them under the Yorkshire travel vlog playlist on our channel. Now, the feature interview that we have today is one that we've done on our recent trip. Shauna Richardson is a UK artist who creates realistic, life-sized animal sculptures using crochet. Her work has been exhibited internationally at many prestigious galleries and to high critical acclaim. So just to give you an idea of what's going to come in the interview, one of Shauna's most fantastic commissions was for the London 2012 Summer Olympics, where she crocheted three 25 feet tall lions, which then toured around the UK in a massive glass display. So I think it's fascinating to see crochet used in such an unusual way. And I think you're going to be blown away when you see her work. Yeah, definitely. And for our Meet the Shepherdess segment, we're going down under to Australia to meet Angela from Blackwattle Yarn and Fibre. Angela runs her own, own alpaca farm, which produces top quality fleece that she then hand dyes. And you can tell from the interview that Angela is a very competent and multi-skilled woman. Yeah. She started her career as a visual artist, then she had a successful career in government and finally turned to alpaca farming and yarn dyeing. So you'll enjoy hearing her story and her yarns, by the way, are gorgeous. They are really gorgeous and she has a lot of different blends and variety. Yeah. So this episode also includes a short cultural segment. We visit and explore the famous Bronte sisters family parsonage home where they grew up and also the surrounding moorlands where they played as children and that features so strongly in their novels. And of course Madeline and I have a lot of knitting projects to share with you so we hope you really enjoy this very full program. So we're going to start with under construction. Last episode I told you about the two little tote bags I was going to make for my little cousins Simba and Leia. Here's a picture of them. So this design is called Folk Bag. It's from Martin Story's book Aaron and Nordic Knits for Kids and the yarn is Rowan Felted Tweed and the book has altogether 25 different designs for babies and young children. Here's the book here. It's a gorgeous book with really stunning designs in it. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. as usual, mum has made a whole lot of changes to the original design. So this is the bag, the finished bag. And the design uses Fair Isle, which is one of the reasons I chose it. But the pattern has you knitting the bag in pieces and then seaming them together. And the thing is, this means that I'd be purling in Fair Isle a lot of the time, which we just didn't think was necessary for a bag. Yeah. So the pattern has you knitting a front and a back piece, two side panels and a gusset. And the front and the back pieces each have four dolls widthwise and the side panels have one doll widthwise each. So that makes a circumference of 10 dolls altogether. So all I did was cast on for 10 dolls and then I knit the body in the round. So you can see here there's no side seams. Yeah. And then the bottom part of the bag is a simple panel of stocking stitch. So when I finished knitting the bag in the round with the right side facing me, I picked up 14 stitches, which is the width of one doll and the width of what would have been a side panel. Mm. And then I knit the length of the bottom and picked up 14 stitches on the opposite side as well. So then I turned the bag inside out and did a three needle bind off for the very first time. <laughs> and then all that was left to do was sew the sides of this panel to the bag. Yeah. So that's how we constructed the body of the bag. And the next change we made was to the rim. So the top part is made in garter stitch, which is definitely looser than foul. Yeah. The pattern didn't tell you to go down any needle sizes. I went down a couple, but that wasn't quite enough because I did want the top to be nice and firm. Yeah. Um, so I ended up knitting some extra facing and turning that over for double thickness. And that worked well. Apart from that, 
it sort of flopped outwards slightly. So yeah, it, was it wasn't still a bit too loose. And... Yeah, it needed something solid in there. So we thread in some elastic band, some 1.5 centimeter wide elastic band. And now if you look, the bag at the top just pulls in slightly and uh, it just feels nice and solid. So I'm very happy with how that turned out. That was mum's idea as well. <laughs> yep. Okay, so what are so, you going to say next? What about this? Oh yeah, the handles. So the original design has two shorter handles to hold in your hand. But again, mum thought it would look better if we had one single longer strip. So to wear the bag over your shoulder like this. And that um, also makes it easier to take things out of the bag. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I just think it looks really good like that. Yeah. So I'm doing the second one yeah. for, for this bag. This is for the little girl, the little sister. Yeah. And the straps, they have to be strong and have double thickness. So mum thought we could do double knitting and give the inside of the strap a different colour. Yeah, so in the, the original pattern has you, I think it has you knitting uh, double width and then turning it around and seaming it down one side. But I just thought it would be so cool to get another colour in, you know, underneath, just have a peak of colour in. So I thought yeah. we could do the same, have the same effect just by doing double knitting. Yeah. And I think that turned out really well. Um, and then yeah, we... so the bags got more and more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> but they did. I, yeah. I didn't really mind too much though because I like to learn new techniques and I learned how to do a three needle bind off. I was supposed to learn double knitting on these straps, but I was a bit overwhelmed with uni, so mum took over the straps for me. Um, and after that, we so after we knitted the double knitting, we thread in some thicker, stronger material into the double knitting. Yeah. Um, yeah, so for extra strength. And I think the pattern does tell you to do that. Yeah, the pattern told you to do that on the small handles. Yeah. So then I sewed this material, which is sort of, I, I, it's a sewing thing, so I'm not sure exactly what it's called, but it's some form of bias binding that's quite thick. So I sewed it actually with the machine down the bottom onto its own strap, but then also I sewed it onto... Uh, the elastic band so it's actually quite a stable structure because mm -hmm. knitting is pretty stretchy and if you're putting things in it you don't want it to sort of stretch out so yeah all of the strength should be coming from the elastic in well a sense done. I hope <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so this is Simba's bag I finished this one first and mum originally thought that the original pattern would be too small. So she suggested that I cast on for 12 doors instead of 10, which I did for this one. Um, but then I ended up having to add an extra row of dolls so that the bag would actually be square and not too wide. Yeah. That would look a bit weird. Uh, yeah, and this was a lot of knitting. It was more than I'd expect it to be doing. So I got a little bit frustrated and decided to only cast on for 10 dolls for Leia's bag. Um, but she's, which she's three years younger, so I yeah. think it's still a big bag for a little girl. Yeah, I think so too. I still had to add an extra row of dolls though, so the pattern tells you to only have two rows, but again, that would have looked too too wide compared yeah. to the length. Yeah. yeah, and then they're lined as well, aren't they? So yeah. show the lining of that one. Yeah, so this bag has uh, dolls with blue trousers and, and uh, skirts, so we gave the lining a blue colour. And it has little scissors all over it as well. I think and that's really cute. if you look closely in, on the background, you've got little pattern pieces. So it's definitely yeah, a yeah. crafting bag material. Yeah. And this one's got this gorgeous, pretty orange lining. It's going to have it. And if we just hold this, just hold that there, mm -hmm. a bit there, you're going to see what this one will eventually look like, which is very cute as well. <laughs> <laughs> They're totally adorable bags, but we will send them off. I won't keep them <laughs> as tempting as it is to do so. But you did a really great job. Thank you. So well done. And I, I do I'm think sure... it was more of a team effort, though. Well, I sort of helped with the designing and the straps, but you did everything else and a, a very good job. Oh, and by the way, right at the end of this episode, Simba is going to show you her finished poncho that she's been working on. And that poncho has been a mammoth project for her because I think each row has over 100 stitches. Probably close to 200 stitches. Yeah, yeah. And, and she's been knitting a couple of rows every single day before she goes out to play with her friends. Very and, cute. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to learn discipline. 
And uh, she also made a whole lot of little poncho, uh, pom-poms, not ponchos, yeah, yeah. that she sewed onto her poncho in random places for extra decoration. So you'll be seeing her sewing in the last ends and then modeling the poncho for us. And her little sister Leia is keeping her company and possibly doing some crafting of her own. Yes, it's super cute. Yeah. So we're moving on to bring and brag now because I've finally finished Devote, which I'm wearing. This garment has been a long time in the making and I've also spoken about it for a long time because originally Andrew was going to knit it for me. It's a perfect design for Andrew to knit. There's a lot of stocking stitch in it. He loves stocking stitch, but he also liked to make something that was really stylish and unusual. Mm. And it is a stylish, unusual design. Yeah. So it's a Kim Hargraves design and it comes from her book, Covet. The recommended yarn is the Rowan Alpaca Soft DK, but I used the John Arben Devonia DK, and this colorway is Broken Flower, and I think it's a gorgeous, gorgeous color. I think mm -hmm. it suits me, and I, I think I might make some more things in this color. You have to remember that anything that suits you also suits me, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have to remind mum to make the sleeves slightly longer so if she ever gets sick of the jumper, she can give them to me. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so it's actually a very easy jumper to knit or, or design to knit. It's knitted bottom up in pieces and then sewn together. The front section is a wrap around and you knit the stocking stitch sections first. So you start at the hem, knit up, and then you knit the stocking stitch, which is shaped like this right up to the shoulder seams. Both front pieces are exactly the same, just mirror image. Once you've finished these front pieces here, you attach them to the back piece with the, uh, via the side seams and shoulder seams, and then you knit the garter stitch shawl collar. And you, so you do this shawl collar separately, and once it's finished, you actually sew it on to the stocking stitch sections. Now the pattern has you knitting the garter stitch shawl collar in two pieces, and then giving it a seam at the back of the neck. But I decided instead just to graft my two pieces together. So here's a picture showing you my graft in garter stitch at the back of the shawl collar. You can't even see it, and I think it's a much better result than having a seam at the back of your neck. So grafting in garter stitch is even easier than grafting in stocking stitch because you're doing the same thing on both needles. So with your grafting needle, you slip the first stitch knit, uh, knitwise off the needle, and then you thread the grafting needle purlwise through the second stitch, but you leave it on the needle. And you do this first on the front needle, and then you do the exact same thing on the back needle. So in your hat head, the pattern that you need to remember is just simply knit off, purl on, knit off, purl on etc and you just keep repeating that until you've run out of stitches. This is obviously going to make more sense to those of you who've already done some grafting so don't worry if you're new to grafting and you don't quite understand what I'm saying. There's a lot of tutorials on the internet on how to graft and you can actually graft in almost any pattern but most people have only done grafting in stocking stitch because that's typically what you do right at the toe of a sock but just in case you didn't know grafting in garter stitch is even easier than grafting in stocking stitch. Now I did actually run out of yarn on this project. It's meant to have two long knitted ties which you wrap around your waist just to hold the front sections together. I'm going to buy some yarn and actually knit those long ties because I think it's all going to work much better. But in the meantime I came up with a temporary solution because I really wanted to finish this garment and take it with me to the UK and wear it there. So here's a close-up picture to show you what I've done. To keep it closed, I sewed on some large press studs on both sides of the inside crossover front pieces. And then I made a loop by casting on some stitches and immediately casting off again on the very next row. And I sewed the loop in place and bought this gorgeous large button which just happens to be exactly the right colour. Now, the weight of the shawl collar does mean that it has a tendency to, to want to kind of fall outwards like this, which exposes the seam here, and that doesn't look very good. So the challenge for me was to place the press studs and the loop with the button high enough so that this just wouldn't happen. So I think I've managed to do that pretty well. I think my solution is good. 
But the only problem is that those big press studs are really quite hard to open and you need those fake gel fingernails, you know, the ones that are so thick and secure you could actually hang your body weight on. Oh, them. gosh. <laughs> that sounds painful. I don't have them. But you need them to be able to, you know, open up these press studs. So at the moment I just leave the press studs and the button shut and I kind of wiggle my way in and with the garment coming over, over the top of my head. So when I leave it, it, it actually looks nice. But if I had those ties, I wouldn't have any of that problem. And I really hate fussing with my clothes. So I'm going to get the, the extra yarn and knit the ties. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I'm not the expert as far as this goes, but I always wonder whether this is too heavy a fabric because I kind of feel like it'd be easier if you just had it close a bit higher up. Well, if, yeah, you, this is something you have to watch when you're knitting sort of unusual fancy designs because sometimes they're not as practical to knit. If you're going to wear a, a, a really warm fabric, you're probably going to want to ha have it like closed right up, yeah. which this doesn't do. So that's not – it's a little bit too glamorous in a way to be practical. But it's. I think it's still fine. You can still wear it with a little bit of – breeze <laughs> so actually coming right up now you're going to see Madeline modeling the devote outside because I wanted you to be able to see it from all different kinds of angles and she's doing that in our garden which is very bare and not looking so good right now so that's coming up now straight after that we're going to Australia to meet Angela from Black Wattle Yarn and Fibre It's Angela from Black Waddle Yarn and Fibre here. I'm a business owner and a packer farmer, an indie dyer, a fibre art teacher and an artist. And on top of all of that, I'm crazy passionate about all things alpaca. With my husband, Matthew, we, we live on a farm in Murray Bateman, New South Wales, which is just outside of Canberra, which is the capital of Australia. We have lived on a farm for about 12 years now. And both our yarn business and our alpaca farm is named after the native black wattle trees that you'll find across our property. Now, our farm is small compared to other normal broad-scale farms that you'll find across the country. We breed about 70 to 80 alpacas on our farm. And but being small gives us the opportunity to be more focused on understanding the fleece qualities of our alpacas and to breed and grow premium alpaca fibre, which is what we need for our yarn business. We've lived on the farm for about 12 years now, um, but neither of us have come from farming families. So we've had a very steep learning curve. Um, running the farm means juggling tasks and priorities. Sometimes you could find me working in the dye shed. The next day I could be out giving a hand to an alpaca to give birth. Or you could also find me teaching a crafting class, which is in our workshop sh space. We are always very busy on our farm, but we wouldn't have it any other way. Now, alpacas, they were first originally imported into Australia in 1859 by a gentleman called Charles Ledger. He imported about 260 alpacas um, into the country and he was working um, with the New South Wales government un under an agreement to develop a fleece and fibre industry that ran alongside the merino industry. But due to the delay in getting the alpacas into Australia from Peru, by the time Charles actually got them into the country and they were landed in Sydney, 
um, the interest in alpacas as a fibre industry waned. Um, so the herd was dispersed into smaller lots across the country and then many reportedly died sadly in the drought of 1860 and then the herd was dispersed into smaller amounts across the countries and eventually um, by the end of the 19th century there were none left in the country. The alpacas were then again imported into um, Australia about 30 years ago and the industry since then has been growing from strength to strength. There's some, farms, there's some alpaca farms in Australia that run between two and 3,000 alpacas. So they, they mirror what the merino sheep industry does. Now, people often ask us, why alpacas? Aside from the fact that they're addictive, we actually were living on a small property and we wanted a couple of pets just to help eat, eat our grass down. And after owning our three boys, we moved to our current larger property then the growth of our herd, um, we had all this lovely fibre and we just didn't know what to do with it all. So we approached a couple of small Aussie mills to discuss our first range of yarn and overnight our alpaca yarn business was born. Alpacas are very curious and gentle creatures. They thrive where merino sheep thrive. So where sheep grow, alpaca can grow. And here in Murray Bateman on our farm, it gets really cold during winter. You can see snow on the Brindabella Mountains, which is to the west of us. It doesn't snow on our farm, but it's, we see snow all year round, in all winter round. Yeah, but in summer, it's the exact opposite. Summer is dry and very, very hot. So we shear once a year, which is October, before it gets too hot. Now, our shearer, shearer Ian, he is one of the best of the best. He is one of the eight shearers in Australia who's been inducted into the Shearing Hall of Fame. Um, and he's very calm and respectful for our animals when at shearing, which is very important to us. The fibre grown on our farm is sold directly to spinners um, and we either sell it as raw fibre, which you can see at the front here, or ha we hand dye it um, in lots of colours. Um, all the other fibre that we have is then sent to New Zealand to be processed. We process two bases, two yarn bases in the New Zealand mill, Wattle and Grevillea. Now we use the mill in New Zealand because it has the capacity to fill our business requirements. Our last order to the mill in New Zealand was about one tonne of Australian grown alpaca um, and that one tonne was processed into, into our two bases. Now from a processing point of view, we process alpaca fibre that is 19 to 21 micron, has a comfort factor of 95% or above, and it's also somewhere between 9 centimetres and 12 centimetres uh, long. It gives the consistency of our fibre that we process. The fibre is also dehaired. Now, dehairing is, is a step in the, in the yarn processing where all the coarse secondary fibres are actually removed prior to spinning. Um, that process makes the yarn a lot softer and gentler against your skin. We grow about 5% of our fibre needs on our farm because we're only on, we have 70 alpacas and 40 acres. We just don't grow enough fibre to suit our needs. So we purchase fibre that matches our processing requirements from other alpaca breeders in South Australia and New South Wales. Um, we also grow other bases that have been, we also sell other bases that the fibre has been grown in Europe and in Peru. I think I've spent my whole life training to be where I am now. I'm a trained artist. Um, I did study a Bachelor of Visual Arts at university and after completing university, I went on to a career in retail followed by government policy, of all things, before coming full circle back to my creative side. Instead of painting on a canvas like I did at university, I now paint on yarn. <laughs> it's very addictive too, by the way. At uni, colour theory was my least favourite subject, but now I, I love that I stuck it through. And for those that know me well, they know that colour is my thing. When creating my new 2020 colour range, I said to myself, I'm only going to have 20 colours. <laughs> wow, that did not last long. 20 soon became 30, 30 soon became 40, <laughs> and before long, I finished on 46 colours. I just could not help myself as there's so many lovely colours waiting to be created. When creating colours, it is very important to understand how they sit by themselves individually, but also how they talk to each other. Creating a colour story gives my customers more options when planning their next, per their next project. Songbird. 
Now, Songbird is one of our best-selling colours. This is Songbird here. But when we were creating Songbird, it actually came from a mistake. I know that doesn't make sense, but bear with me. When I was cre creating a new, our new colours, I made a colour that, that at that time I thought was really lovely. But the next morning when we went to rinse it, I didn't like it so much. So I added another colour to fix it and then we fell in love with it. And then Songbird was created. Now this colour actually connects a lot of colours to other colours. So an example of it is the two ranges that are in front here. So you have Sonnet, Lyric and Songbird connecting to Impulse and Utopia. So you can go from purple to greens, but you can also go from purple to tears. But even with my artistic background and flair, there's a whole set of other factors at play when dyeing yarn that you need to understand. Like how colours connect in the dye pot, how they interact differently with different heat sources, how they react from a chemistry point of view, such as getting the pH levels right, and also getting the heating levels right. All, all of this is very important because without applying the dye rules correctly, the yarn may not turn out as planned. One of my most popular workshops that I teach about three times a year is advanced dye techniques. Over two days, I teach colour theory, what colours work together, which ones don't and why, and also basic chemistry requirements to dye yarn and fibre. <laughs> Understanding colours, moving with crafting trends, growing really good quality alpaca fibre and listening to our wonderful customers has allowed us to grow our business from a small home-based business, which I started in our kitchen, to a business where we now employ three staff. We supply stores here in Australia, Germany and the US, but we also attend large fibre events in Australia and we have a farm shop located in our dye studio, which is on our farm, which is where we're coming to you from today. We are so pleased that along the way that we have been able to share a love of alpaca with the very talented crafting community. It has been a wonderful experience for us here at Black Waddle to introduce knitters, crocheters and spinners to 100% alpaca yarns and blends and to see them grow to love using the colours we create. It brings us a lot of joy to see the wonderful projects that are created using our products. And as a hint, we love show and tell. Thanks for watching. I've loved sharing our story with you all. Happy crafting. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed that segment. I really enjoyed learning about the history of alpaca farming in Australia because that's not something that you immediately think about but alpacas were introduced into different countries at different times and with varying results. So it's interesting to hear that alpacas actually can thrive in the same climate as the merino sheep because not all sheep breeds are happy in the same climate. Merinos really like um, dry hot summers which is typically Australia mm. and they can handle a lot of cold but they can't handle a lot of wet actually that's why the Polworth uh, breed was was developed because that was developed in a, in a sort of a rainy area of Australia but then it's also interesting if you remember back in the episode 97 we interviewed Kerry Lord who is the founder of the UK company Toft and her family were one of the first to bring in alpacas to the UK and they really influenced the breeding of alpacas in the UK. So it's really quite interesting. Yeah. Angela is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 10% discount of all her yarn in her online store. Angela has a large variety of yarn including lace weight, fingering, sports, DK, Aran and Chunky and they come in a variety of blends as well. Yes, so not all her yarn includes alpaca fibre. For example, one of the DK bases is a blend of merino and hemp. 
and another is blue face Lester and silk but then she does also have for example a two ply lace which is a blend of alpaca silk and cashmere and her sport weight is alpaca and silk so there's a lot to look through and there's a lot to get lost in so thank you very much Angela for the discount Producing fruity knitting is my full-time job and Madeline is now helping me alongside her full-time university studies. We are completely reliant on the financial support of our patrons. That's our only source of income. So we're not selling anything and we don't receive any advertising or sponsorship money. And there are substantial costs mm. to producing this show. So we do ask that if you're watching, to please support our work by becoming a patron. And you can do that by following the link that's on the screen here. There's a live link that's in the description box directly below this video. And when you click on it, it'll take you straight to Patreon and you can pick your level of support. It's easy and it's flexible. And we really thank you for doing that. And a special big thank you to all of the wonderful patrons who have made it possible for us to produce the show so far. Yeah, thank you very much. Back in episode 106, we featured the UK designer Lily Kate France in our Knitters of the World segment. I immediately fell in love with her designs. They are just my style and for the most part they are easy to knit and also combine with your existing clothes. Yeah. So back when we were in Yorkshire last month, we decided to spontaneously go to the Yarndale Fibre Festival in Skipton and we actually met, ended up meeting Lily Kate in person, which was cool. Yeah, quite unexpectedly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And she just brought out her very first yarn range, uh, which supports all of her patterns. And this is always a big step for a designer, so it was quite exciting for Lily. Yes, and her yarn's really gorgeous. It's, uh, it's made or produced by Fibre Spates, and Fibre Spates is a UK wholesale yarn company. And they also produce Carol Feller's yarn, the uh, newer worsted and newer sport. And if you don't know who Carol Feller is, she's an excellent Irish designer, and we interviewed her back in episode 80. Anyway, so what I'm saying is that Fibre Spates produce excellent yarns and Lily's yarn is totally gorgeous as well. Yeah, it's called Axis. It's worsted weight and is 90% merino, 10% suri alpaca and comes in 12 different colours. The yarn feels gorgeous. It's super soft and with the 10% suri alpaca it's drapey but not too heavy. And this is the pattern I'm going to knit. It's called Ribblesdale Vest and it's a tailored vest or a waistcoat done in the brioche stitch. I've been wanting to make myself a vest for a while now and I like the simplicity of this particular design and I'm also excited about finally learning how to do the brioche stitch. Yeah, she started on a little swatch just for practice. Yeah. Here it is here. It's very bouncy. It is. It's, it's yeah. a very uh, squishy kind of fabric. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the vest, as you can see from the pictures, is going to be quite versatile. You can wear it over a dress or over a blouse with some jeans. I think Lily does a good job modelling it and showing it off on different clothes. Yeah, she's a very skilled woman, yeah. young, young woman. <laughs> and I really wish her a lot of success. She's a very good entrepreneur and she's a really hard worker. And yeah. that's fantastic. So I, I wish you all the success, Lily. And you've got a stunning yarn. Yeah. And gorgeous designs. Yeah, so I actually had a bit of trouble of picking the yarn because I'm always attracted to the really rich but bright colours, so like the aqua, but I actually wanted something neutral that would combine easily with most of my clothes. So I did end up going for this forest green instead, and it's called Penumbra. And I think Lily studies physics, or she studied physics, so she n named all of her yarns after some terms in astronomy, and I googled Penumbra. And I've learned that the penumbra is basically the area um, where you stand if a light source is only partially covered by another object. So you'd be standing in the penumbra if you're witnessing a partial solar eclipse, for example. Yeah. Okay, and is an umbra a total eclipse? Uh, possibly, I've forgotten it. There's umbra, antumbra, there's all these umbra okay, okay. terms. Yeah. Oh well, maybe <laughs> Lily can let us know. Yeah. <laughs> She's the expert. But I think this colour is going to look gorgeous with your eyes. Thank you. Yeah, and I think I might be able to borrow it. Mm. I've actually been meaning to borrow your Henry VIII. Have you? If we're talking about oh. borrowing. <laughs> That's my very, very good one. Mm. <laughs> 
But this is, yeah, her yarn is really, really gorgeous. And I think just putting a tiny bit of alpaca in is a great thing because it feels even better than what it looks. Mm. It's very soft and very drapey, but it's not going to mm -hmm. be heavy, like you said. Yeah. Yeah, so you better get cracking because mm. I'm really excited to see it finished. Me too. We're going back to bring and brag now. We've been oscillating between bring and brag and under construction back and forth, but I've actually got two little finished projects which I haven't previously even spoken about or shown you. Now, I am known for being a really selfish knitter. I know that. I love to knit myself garments. And I also enjoy knitting Madeline Andrew garments. And one of the reasons is because when you do finish, you spend a lot of time knitting a jumper or a garment. And when you put, you do your best work and you really fall in love with it, it's really hard to say goodbye to it and send it off somewhere. Mm. So when I knit for Andrew or Madeline, I just see them walking around in it. And I, I so I see them, see the garments every day anyway. And I particularly loved knitting for Andrew because he only ever wore my jumpers. Yeah. And he really loved them. Yeah. And he was very, he looked gorgeous in them and he was very huggable. Actually, I think most people are huggable when they put on a, on a hand-knitted woolen jumper. But if you're not getting enough hugs in your life, maybe that's something you can do. Make sure that you're wearing some hand-knitted woolen jumpers because I They're think... They're magical. Yeah, they sort of make people want to do this to you. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm getting over my selfishness. And I've got good reason well to, done. yes, I know, good reason to, because my younger sister Fiona, who is Leia and Simba's mum, you meet, you've already met Leia and Simba, they pop up at the end of every op episode doing their crafting in some beautiful scene of Australian bush somewhere. Well, their mother Fiona is my younger sister by 14 years actually. She's pregnant again with twins and the twins are expected early December. So I have knitted them, and I need your assistance mm. now, yep. two gorgeous little matching waistcoat vests, which are super, super cute. Yep. Yeah, I think so too. So they're very gorgeous. And I've knitted a size uh, for, for a six-month-old baby because I'm hoping that they will get to wear them. When they're six months old, it should be winter time in Australia. So I'm really hoping that they'll get a lot of wear out of them. They do actually look kind of tiny, but because I've forgotten what, how big babies are at what ages they are. But I'm, I think that twin babies should be slightly smaller than a single baby, although maybe by the time they're six months, they've, they've caught up to a typical single baby. Anyway, I hope it's. I hope they're big enough, and I hope they'll get enough uh, wear out of them. The problem is where they live in Australia. It's a really hot climate. They live in the Byron Bay area, which is about two hours south of Brisbane on the Gold Coast. So, winter time for them, their winter is probably warmer than a Northern European summer. So let's really <laughs> at times. Yeah. So let's really, really hope that Australia gets a freezing cold winter next year so that these babies can get some wear out of these gorgeous vests. So I made use of Martin Story's book again, The Aaron and Nordic Knits for Kids. There's some stunning designs in this. So the design is called Joseph Waistcoat. The recommended yarn is the Rowan Wool and Cotton 4-ply Blend. I use the Norwegian yarn Sandness Baby Wool, which translates just simply as baby wool. It's 100% merino and it's machine washable. So the pattern is a gorgeous checkerboard of cabled crosses. And it wasn't an intuitive pattern to memorize, but by the time I finished the second garment, I did have it easily memorized. So you knit the front and back pieces separately and then sew them up and pick up stitches for the armholes, front button band and shawl collar and knit a one by one rib. And again, the pattern said to knit the shawl collar in two pieces with a seam at the back of the neck. And I just couldn't see why that was necessary. So I just knitted in one piece and used short rows. So there they are. I think the Sandness yarn, they produce absolutely stunning colours. Like they're not really clear, bright colours or strong colours. They're quite uh, subtle, even um, antique shades, I'd mm. say. 
so I really like them. You might notice they've got different buttons on them. I, when I went to the button store to buy buttons, I forgot to take both colours. I only took the blue. So I got these really nice discreet blue buttons here and then I thought, oh, I'll just get the same buttons but in, in their yellow shade for this one. But they were just way too neon. Yeah. That was really sad. So yeah. I had to look through my stash and then I found these buttons here which have got little trees on them. I think they're slightly heavy for the design but they're still better than the, than the neon ones. I think they're all right. But do you know if you can wash them? Yes, okay. you should be able to. You should be able to. So I think they're going to look gorgeous on the girls. Now, both uh, Fiona and her husband, her, her partner is actually German, which is yeah. an interesting coincidence since she met him in Australia. But they've both got very blue eyes and very blonde hair. They look like a couple of Vikings. And as you've seen, Simba and Leia are very blonde and blue-eyed. So these babies are definitely going to have the same complexion. And I think these two colours will look really good with that complexion. Yeah. So let's hope Australia has a really cold winter and the babies get good wear out of them. Yeah. <laughs> now, last month when we were travelling through the UK, we actually stayed in the village of Harworth for two weeks. Harworth is in Yorkshire and we used it as a base and we took day trips out to do interviews in uh, different places. And Harworth is also where the famous Bronte sisters grew up and lived as adults. So while we were there, we visited the Bronte sisters family parsonage museum because their father was a parson there. So all three Bronte sisters are considered to be literary geniuses. Charlotte the oldest is most famous for her novel Jane Eyre. Emily the second oldest is famous for Wuthering Heights. And Anne the youngest is best known for the tenant of Wildfell Hall or Angus Gray. And they had a brother called Branwell who they were very close with as well. And he grew up to be an artist. In fact, the picture you're looking at now is a replica of a portrait that he did of himself with his three sisters. But he was pretty self-destructive and he ended up dying at age 31. Yeah, he suffered from addiction to opium, I think, and a whole lot of other drugs as well. Yeah, so when we went to the um, Bronte Parsonage Museum, I also bought myself a book by Emily uh, Bronte, The Wuthering Heights, and I'm about halfway through it now. It's very different to what I expected. Um, so some of you will have read this book, but for those who haven't, it's basically a tale of two families who live on the moors and about their chaotic relationships. So on the one hand, there's intense love, particularly between the two main characters, and on the other hand, there's an immense amount of just emotional and physical abuse. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, one scene that really popped out to me um, was when this character called Hindley gets angry at his infant son who starts crying at the sight of him. So he, in a fit of rage, he takes his son and holds him over the staircase banister and then accidentally drops his own son. So luckily, Hindley's arch enemy Heathcliff walks by and just catches the baby out of reflex. But then moments later... Like the book says that Heathcliff regrets catching the boy because it would have been the perfect revenge against Hindley <laughs> if his son had fallen to his death. So it's really crazy stuff and it was very controversial when it was first published. Um, but I find it terribly interesting to read about these just dysfunctional relationships and how they also get passed on from generation to generation. Yeah, it is amazing. Yeah. Actually, they all led quite isolated lives and apart from just elementary schooling, they were pretty much self-educated and as children they developed elaborate fantasy worlds and spent a lot of time playing in and walking around the malls that actually go right up to the back door of the parsonage. And they're living in the mid-19th century, which is the Romantic period, so they were also very heavily influenced by these very big Romantic figures of Lord Byron and Sir Walter Scott. But I find their male characters in the novels particularly interesting because they're often not described as handsome. In fact, sometimes they're even described as a little bit ugly. But nevertheless, they're still really compelling, magnetic, powerful, dark characters with troubling or confusing behavior. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, so, and I was also, when I started reading the Bronte novels, I was also really surprised, amazed actually, at how much emotional and physical abuse mm -hmm. is kind of written into almost all of the novels in different ways. So there's abuse between parents and children, but also between siblings and, and then sometimes also between children and animals. It's, it's kind of interesting. But getting back to the siblings... Originally, there was actually five sisters, so mm. two older than Charlotte. So it went Maria, Elizabeth, Charlotte, Emily and Anne. And when Charlotte, the middle one, was only five years old, the mother died. So then Charlotte and the two older sisters were sent to a boarding school. And then later, Charlotte based the hellish orphanage in Jane Eyre on this boarding school where she and her sisters were sent because they really suffered there. They were very, very cold and very hungry. And actually, the two older sisters caught tuberculosis at this boarding school and they mm. died at the ages of 10 and 10 11. 10 and 11, yeah. I know, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. So, and, and actually all of the Bronte siblings ended up dying of tuberculosis. So the three younger ones, Charlotte, Emily and Anne, and the brother Branwell all died as young adults. And Charlotte outlived her brothers and sisters. She lived the longest and died at 38. And the father outlived the wife and all of his children mm. and he died at um, ages age 80 I think yeah but what's yeah. interesting is that the oldest sister Maria she was considered to be the most brilliant of all the sisters so you can just imagine what she might have contributed to English literature if we'd had antibiotics back then mm. it's it's pretty incredible yeah yeah anyway we're sure that there's probably quite a lot of Bronte fans in our audience so we put together some footage exploring the inside of the parsonage but also the moorlands that they played in and that features so heavily in their novels. So we really hope you enjoy it. This room is the dining room in the parsonage and Charlotte, Emily and Anne did a lot of their writing here. Their world famous novels, Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights and Agnes Grey were all written in this room. And in the evenings the sisters would also walk around the table discussing their stories. And it's thought that Emily died on the sofa here in this very room. Mr Bronte, the father, used this room as a study and it's where he did all of his parish business. And the cabinet piano in the corner was mainly played by Emily and Anne. This is also where Mr Bronte gave his children their school lessons and he really encouraged their interest in literature, politics, art and music. And I just think it's amazing how many activities actually went on in such a small room. They must have been really organised. This is the kitchen. The Bronte sisters were expected to take on a share of the household tasks. When their mother died, they were all very young and their aunt looked after them. But then after the aunt died, Charlotte and Anne worked away from home as governesses and Emily acted as the housekeeper. So Emily did all the baking and the ironing and she wrote that this allowed her mental freedom to think about her writing. This room is now a display room holding Charlotte's writing desk and its contents and also some of her clothes. The room was originally used by the parents, Mr and Mrs Bronte. After Mrs Bronte died, her sister Elizabeth came to the family to look after the children and it was her room. And then years later, when Charlotte married, she and her husband lived in this room and eventually Charlotte died in this room as well. So all three girls drew and painted. They did landscapes, their dog Flossie, and also each other. But there are more portraits of Anne, the youngest, than any other member of the Bronte family. This is Charlotte's writing desk with its contents. And this lace collar is believed to have been made by Anne for Charlotte. And the dress, the stockings and the gloves that are behind it, as well as the bonnet and the handbag, 
They all belong to Charlotte. The next very tiny room here is called the Children's Study. Apparently the servants gave it that name and it was allocated to the Bronte children as a playroom and they would read and write about their imaginary worlds here and then later it became Emily's bedroom. Now Bradwell's room here, this is set up as Bradwell's studio because he was an artist. The room looks appropriately chaotic and slovenly. So Bradwell worked for a while as a portrait artist, but he eventually became addicted to alcohol and opium. And he was sacked multiple times from various employment and he actually ended up being a pretty big disappointment to his whole family. This painting here is called The Gun Portrait. It's a copy of Branwell's portrait of himself and his sisters. The original painting was destroyed by Charlotte's husband, Arthur Nichols, and this copy was painted for the BBC drama To Walk Invisible. So next up is Mr Bronte's bedroom, and after his wife died, Mr Bronte moved into this room. The bed isn't original, but all the other items of furniture are original. And in Branwell's later years, his addiction to alcohol and opium became so bad that he became a danger to himself and to the family, and he needed to be constantly watched over. So Mr Bronte eventually gave him this room so he could look after him almost permanently. And Branwell died in this room too, at the age of 31.
I hope you enjoyed that beautiful, beautiful music. I picked that music for a few reasons. Firstly, I thought it just really fitted in with the mood, but also because it's Schubert's fantasy in F minor for two hands, so it's a piano duet, and Schubert is a romantic composer, so he composed that piece of music probably when Charlotte Bronte was about 10 or 11 years old. So Schubert was an adult when the Bronte sisters were children. So he comes in as being an early romantic composer. But it is stunning, stunning music. And he wrote it, it's a piano duet, for one of his piano students who was an aristocratic woman who he was desperately in love with. And it was probably the love of his life. Unfortunately, in true romantic pathos, she only thought of him as a friend. So it was unrequited love. Mm. <laughs> That's very sad. Yeah. Anyway, it is time for us to say goodbye now because coming up is the interview with Shauna Richardson, which we hope you enjoy. And don't forget to watch right to the very end to see two very cute Aussie sugar plum fairies crafting in the Australian bush. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Welcome to Fruity Knitting. Today I'm in Norfolk in a town called Overstrand and I have a really fascinating guest with me. <laughs> Shauna Richardson creates realistic, life-sized animal sculptures using crochet. Her work's been exhibited internationally and at many prestigious galleries and museums here in the UK. And Shauna invented the term crochet dermy to describe her work. Obviously, it's like taxidermy. Mm -hmm. And although the medium and the method are deeply traditional, the results are as far away from conventional crochet as you can imagine. So I'm really thrilled that you've agreed to this interview. Oh, you're welcome. And thanks for inviting us into your home. It's my pleasure. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay, so you learned to crochet as a child and then you studied fine art at university. That's right. So how did you come to bring the craft and the art concept together to create Crochet Dermy? Um, well, I guess it started um, when I was younger. I used to paint and uh, draw from life, uh, including life models. There's a lot of anatomy yeah. in that. And um, it wasn't until I was older that I went to university to study fine art. Um, I've got ADHD, so rules never really worked for me. Um, and the same applied when I got to university. I was looking for rules to break and ideas to challenge. Um, but within fine art, that's quite a difficult thing to do. Because like anything always goes. always been broken. <laughs> exactly. Anything goes. Nothing goes. So the void's been used over and over, yeah. you know, over time to... Been, it's been presented as work, immaterial things. So an example would be Eve Klein. In 1958, he presented the void. He just... There was an empty gallery and he was in it and he just was exploring his own aura being the artwork. So I'm really comfortable with that. I, you know, I get it. But I think me being comfortable was the issue. So it wasn't until I started playing around with traditional craft and crochet and accessible objects that, you know, I was quite uncomfortable. Um, so... Okay, yeah, because your, your craft is traditional yeah. and... Um, the look of, of taxidermy is is also a deep traditional yes. skill. Yeah. So you've taken things that are very conventional. Very conventional, and animal themes as well. They're very yeah. conventional. But then using crochet with it is like pushing against the boundaries it of what is. people it was, perceive. Exactly. It's just something really uncomfortable with it. You know, the empty space within art, fine, but present a thing, an inaccessible thing, it's not quite 
so it doesn't sit so easily. Yeah. Okay, so, and the first big project was a big bear, wasn't it? So tell yeah. us about that. So when I was exploring traditional craft, the first thing I made was, um, a, it was about five or six foot brown bear. Um, and part of my exploring was I entered it into a really traditional uh, flower and produce show. Um, and I was just so busy playing with the idea that I didn't think it through. I didn't, you know, I didn't think about the outcome. But unfortunately for some really good bakers and gooseberry growers, I left at the end of the day with the cup for best in show. <laughs> That's great. I can just so you entered it into what the crochet and knitting one crocheted item, yeah. So it was on a table with booties and you know really nice items, but it it was sticking yeah. out a bit, yeah. Well, of course it had to win the prize because they wouldn't the judges yeah. wouldn't have seen something like that very often. Yeah, I just I really didn't think it through. It, it, it felt like it backfired a little bit. Oh, I, I think you should enjoy it. So was that the first time that you saw that people were really quite interested in that concept and is that what started you off on, on? Yes, I think the it was just it felt really uncomfortable. It felt challenging to me. The the concept of it really excited my brain, but maybe a little bit too much. But then along the way I found that the process, the repetitive nature of crochet and um, the rhythm of it just really fed into my urges to hyper-focus. So the longer the project, the better. Okay, that's why it was a, a six-foot bear. Yeah, was the first thing I made, of course. Wow, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so before we get further into the interview, I just want our viewers to see more of your work so they could get a picture of what you okay. do. So can you tell us about some of your most successful commissions? Um, I think if we're talking about scale, the largest thing that I've done is the Lionheart Project. Um, and that was an Arts Council Commission. Um, it was when the Cultural Olympiad was set up to celebrate um, the London 2012 Olympic Games. Um, and I was invited to create a piece that reflected the region that I lived in. And I was living in the East Midlands, which has a really rich textile heritage. Um, so I chose to use textiles and create three, I made three 25 foot lions. And the lions were based on Richard the Lionheart's crest who has associations with the East Midlands. Um, so I crocheted them over a period of about two years um, and then had a bespoke glass case, exhibition case made. And then it toured around the country in 2012. That's amazing. And here we've got some of the yarn that you used. So yes. tell us about this. Where was it sourced? And So right from the beginning of the project, um, British Wool helped me to source the wool. I wanted to, to, if possible, get wool from sheep that were grazing in the East Midlands. So right at the very top, um, British Wool managed to find some Swaledale fleece. Um, so that's where the wool came from. And then they also facilitated it being spun um, in Yorkshire, in a mill in Yorkshire. Okay, so this is the yarn and mm -hmm. it's it looks pretty chunky. It's actually yeah. got a few plies together, three yeah. plies of what I would call uh, maybe a, a worsted weight or even strong. Actually, three plies of chunky have been put together <laughs> to make extra <laughs> yeah. chunky. Yeah. And that's the, the crochet hook. Yeah, so what size hook. crochet? Um, it's a 10 mil crochet hook. Okay. So yeah, yeah, I got through a few of those, just completely wore them out. It's so, not burning as I was doing it. <laughs> I know, they're huge projects. First of all, I want to ask you, I'm really curious why you didn't get any kind of repetitive strain injury because I can imagine you sometimes you'd be working with your arms over your yeah. head in really yeah, awkward... Yeah, it, it was a quite different action because it was such a, a big piece. And very strong movements. Yeah. yeah. The answer to that is I'm not really sure. I did take precautions, mm -hmm. so I limited myself to six hours maximum a day. I tried to limit myself to six hours a day, but sometimes I got a bit engrossed. Um, I also plunged my arms into ice water. I don't know if that helps, but I did it anyway. Um, so I think that's what happened there. I have had a strain before. I've had bursitis, but it wasn't from that particular project. Mm -hmm. It was from another really tight deadline that I had to just work all through the night. So you hired a great big um, garage-looking place, a didn't warehouse. you, for you to, a warehouse yeah, a for you warehouse. to... So tell us how you actually went about it. Were you, you had to do them in pieces and then weld it together. Yes, yes. So I came up with the maquettes of the, um, the animals that I wanted. It's re it was really complicated. It was like a game of chess. So all of the lines had to fit into the largest vehicle I could get on the road. So we had to sort of work backwards and forwards and sideways all the time. But 
I produced a maquette of the the shape of the animals that I wanted, of the lions. I got a polystyrene sculptor to scale those up, make the structure that they were going to be insecure in in the vehicle. I had them brought to the warehouse and then I filleted them all so that the, the, the pieces were still huge, but they were a size that I could manage, that I could lift. So I crocheted them all in sections and then reassembled it and then they were installed in the truck. Okay, so that's one massive successful commission yeah and then you did the Bremen musicians I think mm-hmm. they're, they're my personal favorite so tell us about oh, those okay so the Lionheart project was a bit of a departure from my normal work my normal work is life-size animals mm-hmm. um so the Bremen musicians really it was a challenge because it was a stack of animals I hadn't done a, like animals stacked up like that before um also I wanted a really small footprint for gallery use but I wanted it to have the most the biggest impression so it was really tall um, so yeah, it was the the donkey, the dog, the cat, and the rooster on the top. On top of each other, yeah. and even the donkey's life size. It's actually a little bit larger. Really? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's big. Okay. It's really big. I think it's about twelve foot all in yeah. all. Okay, and the Bremen musicians is based on the Brother Grimm's fairy yeah, tale. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And why did you pick them? Um, I picked. I think really, I picked the folk tale so that I could do a stack of animals. If I'm to be honest. Um, but I, yeah, I chose to do it in all in grey. Um, I quite liked the sort of sculptural element of that. So I was playing with all sorts of things in that. And also it was the first bird that I'd ever attempted, which I was quite interested to try. So what was the hardest out of all of the four animals? Um, the rooster was the first time I'd done feathers, which I think it turned out okay. But for me, because realism is so important, it was a bit of a leap from crochet to feathers. Um, getting the structure to be stable and freestanding yeah. was quite a, um, a challenge but also for some reason that that had the most upside down work that I've ever done and so that I was a bit queasy with that so that was quite a big challenge <laughs> okay so and for that I mean we'll go into the technical mm. details more later but basically you're using the same stitch aren't you one single stitch, yeah. yeah. So double crochet. It's okay. called in the UK and the US it's single crochet. Yeah, But okay. just in different directions. And that was a DK weight yarn. Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. And then if you pass this one over, this is okay. a, another commission, isn't it? Okay. Tell us about so the story that of this. Was, that was commissioned by the Guardian Weekend magazine. Um, and myself and a few other artists were invited to create a portrait of a living royal of our choice, and I chose Prince Harry. Um, at the time, he was partying quite hard, and um, he was a little bit wayward, hence the baboon. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and so was it on display anyway? It was a commission by it the, the ga- Guardian the, Weekend yes. magazine. Yeah. Um, it was commissioned to actually go into print in the magazine. Okay. So it's been here ever since. That's great. As I said, your work has been exhibited in some very prestigious galleries and mm. museums. For example, yeah. in London, in the Saatchi Gallery yes, and the yeah, Natural yeah. History Museum and yeah. also the Victoria and Albert Museum. Yeah. And then on a very different scale, you set up an art insta- installation of your animals in a local empty store just to amuse and surprise mm, people yes. who might be walking by and wanting to <laughs> peer in the windows. Yeah. So what would you like people to think about or how would you like them to react when they see your work? Because I do imagine that their interaction could also be part of the artwork. I really enjoy doing an intervention, so just bringing something a bit out of the ordinary into everybody's lives. And I guess that's with the Lionheart Project, it was the same by taking it around. So this was just an extension of that, really. Um, Yeah, so I turned... A, sh- a Victorian shop, so it looked like a Victorian house anyway, and I um, converted it back into a, a house. Um, so from the street, it really did look like it was, you know, s- different living rooms and a private dwelling, um, and I filled that full of crochet dummy trophies and sculptures, and it was just really quite interesting to see people's reactions. I just think it's a real privilege to be able to do something that, you know, brings a smile to people's faces or it's maybe even you know, a memorable experience. Definitely. Yeah, if I can do that, I, yeah, I really enjoy it. Yeah, just going back to the lions, what Mm. was some of the feedback or the reactions that people got when they saw three massive lions being driven around? I think mainly the reactions that stick in my head are just bewilderment. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> so, yeah, just a really unexpected thing to be travelling down the street, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that would give you a thrill. A thrill, yeah, and hopefully a memory. And you were also saying that with this shop that you set up, that you'd often, you know, get people walking by and they're very curious but they want to be polite, the English politeness of not looking in the window. Yes, yeah. But they have to look anyway. I know, that was a bit of the cheekiness in me coming out, I think. I quite enjoyed that. Yeah. <laughs> and actually the same thing's happening unwittingly now. Um, I've got a, a seven-foot polar bear in the corner of the living room and, you know, children are hoisted onto their parents' shoulders every day just to get a better look at the bear. So yeah, unwittingly it's still, it's still going on. That's great. Okay, now what about you told me the story of the BBC putting one of your crocheted dogs oh, yes. in a field. Yes, yeah. So tell us about that. Well, I mean, people's reaction is fantastic. Um, but when an animal reacts to my animals as if they're real, it's I find it extraordinary. It's, it's yeah, I love a dog barking at a dog that I've made, or in the case that you're talking about, um, we were filming on location with the BBC, took some of my pieces out into a field and just they just got mobbed by llamas that just came charging, spitting. It's the most flattering thing that has ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> it is, isn't it? It's yeah. a real genuine um, stamp of approval. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. So most of our viewers are really passionate crafters, so we definitely want to see some of the techniques that you yeah. use to create the animals. So can you take us through your artistic or creative process? Yeah, I can do. Um, so when I'm making my work... Um, I think it's one of the challenges is to make animals that out of crochet that don't look like toys. Um, so in the very beginning, I created the skins first. So it didn't matter how much detail that I got into the, the, the crochet piece. If I stuffed it afterwards, it just, all the definition was gone and it, it couldn't support itself. And it just ended up looking like a toy. Um, so it began to become clear that I needed to concentrate on the structure and then the crochet so I now start with a solid form inside the crochet and I crochet around that um, so if I'm lucky I can now source um, a mannequin from a taxidermist that I can adapt um, so I, I create this structure in all sorts of ways so going from that to sticking blocks of polystyrene together and carving the piece like as with this one yeah and it, that's also an example of that isn't it yes yes so um this is something that i wanted to make multiples of so i actually well i started off with an image um of a dodo of a dodo that i made <laughs> um then i would sculpt the so i sculpted the head um using monster clay and then i created i i made a a mold and then cast the head and then hand paint it from there. So Okay, so your all of your life drawing with human forms yeah. made you really familiar with anatomy. Really, yeah, yeah. Really. So I really do find that when I come to do um so the musculature, um, I find that quite I've just got a bank of knowledge in my head that yeah. I refer to. That's the really exciting thing I would imagine. I didn't really know that I was doing it. Yeah. You know, and then people sort of ask me all sorts of questions and I'm like, well, everybody knows that, don't they, sort of thing. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, so do you have to overemphasise everything underneath? I do. With these pieces that I'm just going to hand paint, it's not so necessary. But when it comes to, so this polystyrene form, um, I have to really over-exaggerate the anatomy so that when I cover it with a wall, all the detail's not lost. So, okay, because it flattens it out, doesn't yes, it? Yes, yes. So we'll have a look at this bulldog. Okay. Is that an English bulldog? It is, yeah, made for an American show. We've seen quite a lot of bulldogs <laughs> already since we've come here. Have you? So I'll hold it and, and maybe tell us how you started off and, and all the details about Okay, it. so this was a hand sculpted from polystyrene, so you can probably feel it's very light yes. but stable. Um, I always start with toes because invariably there's so many of them I just don't want to be left with all toes so I get those out of the way first and then I I continue to work up I use circles quite a lot okay um so yeah so um obviously I would start again from a circle work my way out until I've got the shape that I require and then so with a three-dimensional piece, there's always going to be a seam somewhere. So the first piece I made, 
that was a bit of a problem. But now I actually use a scene to help with the anatomy. Okay. So we actually, so yeah, I can see you've got his it. little elbow. So yeah, the 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 elbows. They're just getting more and more pronounced. I don't know. I was like, every time I make a piece, they just oh, get bigger and bigger. So there's quite a lot of detail. The smaller detail, I add with a crochet as I go. So if the stitches can support themselves, then I'll use them to create additional yeah. things like creases and elbows. And, face. and yeah. Yeah, ears and veins. As with the Bremen musicians, it's got quite a lot of veins yes. um, in that one. And that was all done in the crochet process yeah. so I just adapt as I go along okay so you yeah. do all of this in one piece yeah, and the, then yeah the animal was one piece when I did it so that's a bit different from some of them the bigger they get sometimes I need to dissect the animal but this was just one sculpture but then the crochets in sections yeah okay so tell us about the crochet itself it's quite a dense fabric it's it's a chunky mohair um, okay here's some mohair in a different colour yeah. is this typically what you use yes yeah, that is, that's it. So, yeah, it's called Chunky. Mm -hmm. um, and I use a three millimetre hook, which mm -hmm. is obviously smaller than recommended with the Chunky yarn. That gives me the density that I that I like. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to use pure mohair at one stage um, with a British supplier that sadly ceased trading. So now it's mohair mixes with acrylic. Sadly, mohair really does price itself out of my market. Or the, the kind of the quantity that I need, it just isn't financially viable. So they're mixes that I use. And you like the mohair because it gives a little bit of a furry feel, yeah, is that right? It, it, yes, but it's kind of, it's quite coarse furry feel. So yeah, that's, that's the kind of look it's I'm It's more like. natural. Yes, yeah. Okay. Can you tell me how you did these ridges here with these rolls in the back of the Yeah, seat? so I don't know if you can see. So... They will, I will have really, in the polystyrene, really accentuated that. Mm -hmm. And then with the crochet, I can just build it up a little bit okay. more if I wish. So, okay, yeah. so it is still all a single crochet, or double? Yeah, double, oh, that's right. I just, I use double crochet. Okay. Which in America is single crochet, yeah. but it's all, everything is that stitch. Yes, okay, so you haven't done anything with the crochet to make it have that go in, in that indentation. That's just the, the mould underneath. That's the, mainly the mould underneath, yeah. I okay. can add to that, but the actual structure has to be there. Yeah, okay, so it really is the most important bit, in a sense, for the look. It is, all, and but it's the crochet that's my favourite bit. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and and doing the shapes on it, you might be able to see, this is, a, this is one in white, which doesn't show the shapes as well as the darker ones, but we'll show footage of that. But you can see there's, you know, the musculature here is really emphasised, and his little knee, mm. and his ribs here. I think as I go on, they get more and more <laughs> detailed. Emphasized. Yeah, emphasised, yeah. really, yeah. That's great. Okay, now over here, you've got some huge eyes I have to show. Yes. So where have you got, sourced all these from? So you can buy glass eyes from taxidermy um, suppliers. Um, these ones I, I actually had made for the Lionheart project, but they weren't, they weren't quite right, so that's why I've, I've still, still got, got them, them here. So yeah, you can get eyes made... Okay. Requirements. Blue eyes and things. Yeah, some human eyes there for my portraits. Oh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, so in the Prince Harry, he's got human eyes rather than baboon eyes. Yeah, okay. And um, you also obviously have mouth and teeth. And yes, yeah, I have teeth. Um, teeth. I can get some noses, but I, I tend to make those myself as well. Okay. What about this one here? That's, a, that's just an off-the-peg nose. Okay. I can't remember what animal that was. Yeah. But... Um, yeah, it's about 50-50 whether I can find one or have to use yeah. something that I made. So how long would it take to make this guy here? Gosh, Considering I made him a while ago. Yeah, okay, well just... <laughs> something like him. Including the form when you have to sculpture the okay. form underneath. So I would say for something like that, probably about two months, maybe a bit longer. And you're selling on commission as well? Yes, yeah, yeah, I sell on commission. I don't generally exhibit anymore. Um, there's been lots of damaged uh, pieces along the way, so I don't generally do that anymore, but I still work to commission. Yes. Yesterday, Madeline and I drove around the country, countryside to a few different places where Shona has her works, and, and we filmed them, so you'll see that footage as well. Yeah, they look great on walls and, and um, as different you. sort of 
show pieces. Yeah. Very exciting. Good. Now, currently, you're actually working with the New South Wales Ministry of Health in Australia. Yes. Creating body parts for use in sexual assault cases. I am. That sounds like a really interesting and maybe even a it's challenging project. Very challenging. It's challenging. Um, yeah, it's challenging in the scale. So originally I was contacted by um, a forensic scientist um, and she was going into court. She was an expert witness in court and needed some props to take in with her, something not too confrontational. So she got in touch with me to see whether that might be something that I could do. Um, so we spent a long, long time me honing the... I had to sculpt the model um, and... Yeah, then once I sculpted it, I made a mould and casted it in silicone. And now um, I'm crocheting the pieces. But since she um, commissioned that piece, it's been received very well. So now I'm working with the Ministry of Health who have ordered multiples. So it's female genitalia mm -hmm. um, for help in sexual assault cases. So I'm really I'm delighted to be involved with the project because it's really meaningful. You know, if I can help in any small way, I, that's, you know, a fantastic thing to do. But in the making it's very challenging it's small scale even though I've made the model I still have to pretty much sculpt it using the crochet because it's such fine detail mm, okay so we'll just have a quick look at the model okay it's very it's... unconfrontational actually uh, well <laughs> so <laughs> it's quite confrontational at this stage when it's it, crocheted yes it's, we'll it's... talk about the technical side of it yes yeah. so yeah. I think it's so you made this out yeah, of it's not um, complete. out of silicon first I made it with monster clay first, so I actually made the sculpture. Then I cast it. Okay, so um, I'll show you this. Yeah. So um, this is all kind of things that you did, did at fine art school, isn't it? it kind of. Yes. Although, no, yeah. yeah, I was a painter originally, as you know, um, and then I was really into conceptual art, and then I discovered my crochet. So I didn't do an awful lot of sculpting. Okay. Yeah. At the university. Yeah. So you're working in cotton this time. Yep. So tell us about it. Um, it's very fine. I'm on a 1.75 um, needle. Yeah, so this is just just an example of the amount of crocheting that I'm having to do, uh, the sculpting with a crochet hook that I'm having to do. So I can't rely on the model alone. Yes. Even though I've put the details into that, I'm still having to crochet the, the details. Yeah, because I imagine if you put too many details, then it makes the, the whole thing bigger than yes. up to scale and yeah you, yeah. yeah it's got to be scale yeah so it's not a lot okay. of room so you're actually free everything you do is free form in a yeah in a way isn't yeah it, it is yeah okay so how many do you have to do um i'm just doing four at the moment and then see how it goes um hopefully i'll be doing a lot more yeah well i can see it's a challenging project and but it's also really meaningful it is like it is, what yeah. you're saying yeah. which is great and it's very different from the the large display kind of it happy is, work, it isn't is, it? It is completely different. It's just as challenging. Yeah. It's as challenging as the lines were, probably. Maybe. And they they came across your name through your... Uh, yes, I think just online, my online presence. Yeah. Okay, great. So let's finish off now with one last question, and it'll be slightly more philosophical. So we'll okay. go back to your adventures in Crochet Dermy started around... 2007 mm -hmm. when you were sort of inquiring into what does and doesn't constitute as art yes it's 14 I know what's coming now. <laughs> <laughs> it's 14 years later so yes. how have your thoughts developed on this topic well have I found an answer because I was really desperately trying to find out what art was when I was at university and of course there is no there's no definition <laughs> as far as I can see I think it's probably the only thing I can say is that for me when I'm making work it sort of stimulates a part of my brain that other things can't really reach. I quite enjoy the feeling, so I want to do it again. So that's kind of what, what it is for me. As a viewer, I just there are, there's no wrong reaction to something. So, you know, when I'm making something, I've got a certain thing in my head, but it, I'd be very surprised if it was the same thing as somebody who was looking at my work. And I think everybody's an individual, their view's valid. And yeah, so I think it is what it is to you. Yeah. So the age old question of what is there a difference between a craftsperson and an artist is no longer really relevant, is it? Not really. No. <laughs> okay. 
Well, it's been really great to see your work and, and to learn more about it and to have you Thank on you. the Fushi Knitting. Thank you. It's nice to have you here. Yeah. Okay. So let's say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye. <laughs> So we'll, we'll just. I'm made by the royal, not by the camera. <laughs> not by the camera. Okay, okay so just um, look for a little while in the camera and okay. smile and kind of look natural if you can. Okay, now if we sit close together with this, then I can put another picture of her work to the side. Um. <laughs> <laughs>